Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and I am going to read more of our book, Poison Power, by Dr. John Goffin and Arthur Tamplin. And as you can see, we're near the end of it. We're actually only two, ten pages away from the end of this book. I encourage everyone to go purchase a copy of this book and read it for yourself. Uh, you know, I'm not the best reader, and it's been given fragmentedly. I kind of have a busy life, so I haven't gone. I apologize for it lagging a few days, but really, honestly, this is the best I can do. But uh, let me get back to this. We are on Chapter 13 in Poison Power, and it is titled uh, The Ultimate Issue, Conversion or Ecocide. And I think we all know what they picked, Ecocide, right? Whales were washed up this week in India, all over India. It's heartbreaking to watch our brothers and sisters in the ocean die like that. So we're on the top of page 276, and I will continue. To come up with such solutions, we must understand some powerful factors which characterize innovative, profit-oriented enterprise. Number one. The investment of capital by the entrepreneur inv innovator. Today, innovation and technology are very big business. Most endeavors of any consequence, encompassing in a short while the effort, of to, the effort to distribute goods or services of a particular technology to 200 million people nationally, and now it's even larger, and even to larger numbers when foreign outlets are considered. Even the early investment is generally very large. If a particular technology, technological entrepreneurial project has gone along for a period of time, the investment of capital funds soon becomes huge and indeed a matter of considerable importance concerning which the entrepreneur must be extremely protective. It is a characteristic of innovation that there must be initial enthusiasm and promise. And this characteristic makes it very difficult to pre appreciate the adverse byproduct effects such as hazards to life. Two features operate here. A. The subconscious desire to look the other way for an, in for an innovation that holds promise of real utility and profitability. And B the widespread delusion that science and technology will undoubtedly provide a fix for any hazard of the enterprise. That's what's happened in nuclear. The investment, number two, the investment of career by a large body of scientists and technologists who prepare themselves at great cost for this particular enterprise. And if the technology has persisted for any length of time, such men have achieved position, prestige, and high personal economic stake in the future of the enterprise. And I think that speaks to Arne Gunderson, because that's what happened to him, and this is why it took him so long to flip over and say, uh, this is really bad in Fukushima. <clears throat> A case in point is the nuclear energy technology. Whole university departments have devoted themselves to the training of nuclear engineers and related technologists. And beyond the educational level, there are thousands of nuclear engineers, health physicists, and biomedical scientists with well-established careers predicted upon the continuation, excuse me, predicated upon the continuation and growth of nuclear energy technology, in particular nuclear electricity generation. And this doesn't begin to take into account some 140,000 atomic industrial workers with a large stake in the continuation and growth of this industry. Indeed, the governmental regulators themselves have not inconsiderable stake in the nuclear energy enterprise. That's kind of a backward statement of saying they have a huge investment in it. Number three, the investment of ego and prestige by the elite who have thoroughly committed themselves to the glowing promises of the technology in full public view. Again, the longer the enterprise has persisted before, I'm going to start again. Again, the longer enterprise, the longer the enterprise has persisted before adverse features become evident, the greater the ego prestige commitment of such elite and the more difficult it is for such elite to reverse their positions. 
i.e. Fukushima. In nuclear energy, can any fail to understand the difficult position of Chairman Glenn Seaborg, who has admitted his position as a prime salesman for nuclear electricity generation? Well, actually, yes, I 100% fail, Dr. Goffman. I 100% fail. From a myriad of platforms and in countless printed statements, he has stated that, quote, the atom came to us in the nick of time, unquote. Is anyone so naive as to fail to understand why Dr. Seaborg is having difficulty facing the realization that the hazard of ionizing radiation is far greater, 20 to 30 times greater than thought a decade ago? That was 1960 he's referring to. Or to fail to understand why Dr. Seaborg dodges the question of the likelihood of a catastrophic event accident at a nuclear power plant. Or to fail to understand why Congressman Chet Holyfield, having pushed appropriations of billions of nuclear energy development through Congress, clings to the concept of safe amount of radiation exposure, a concept rejected by a whole series of distinguished scientists, as well as all the scientific bodies involved in the study of radiation hazards? It should be unrealistic for any of us to hope that dangerously misguided technological industrial endeavors will come to an end through economic suicide of the capital investing entrepreneur, career and job suicide of the technologists and workers, ego and prestige suicide by leaders, promoters, and apologists to the enterprise. It's odd the way he did that. I'm going to show you the book. You see how he made those small? That was interesting. Hmm. To argue that a higher morality should be guided by should guide all these men with their varied vested interests is simply to produce a totally unreal and unuseful image of men. It is obvious that long range ecocide will necessarily win out over short range parochial economic suicide, career suicide, or ego prestige suicide. And morality won't even visibly enter into consideration, for the mechanisms of rationalization will surface in abundance to protect against even the most obvious indefensible positions. New subtitle, Limited Victories. Some may point out that in spite of all of the above, we can win the battle in the existing framework. The battles, yes. The war, no. Isn't that where we're at right now, you guys? Cyclamates, it will be argued, have been withdrawn from the market in spite of vested producers' interests, in spite of shenanigans of the most reprehensible characters from the Food and Drug Administration. But for every cyclamate withdrawn, there are hundreds or thousands of compounds in the food additive field that haven't even been evaluated for toxicity in any meaningful manner and are not likely to be so investigated. Need we point out the uphill battle to introduce rationality into the pesticide agriculture scene, including the questionable antics of the agriculture department and the state legislatures throughout the country? Need we point out the charade of the National Academy of Sciences appointing primarily atomic energy supported scientists to reinvestigate the hazards of ionizing radiation. Men who have publicly taken a position on the matter at the outset of their supposed study. Those reinvestigations, by the way, is exactly why they move forward. They hired people to rework the scientific studies to deny what John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin found out. Suppose they do come out with recommendations suggesting a slight tightening of radiation standards. Is this a significant step forward in avoiding atomic energy de depredation on the environment and of human heredity? The creation for the centers the creation of centers for adversary assessment of technology can fill an important void can perhaps provide, quote, the other side of the picture, unquote, of the hazards and secondary effects of technology at an early phase. 
before too much economic and ego commitment has occurred for a particular enterprise. Such adversary assessment is an absolute must for ongoing and proposed technologies. It would be required for any proposed solution, since the other side of the picture is an absolute necessity. But unless additional steps are taken, the information developed by the adversaries will be arrayed against very powerful vested interests in all of the areas we've discussed. There is an additional element indeed, ultimately, for the adversary activity to function effectively. And that element is conversion in its broadest sense. New subtitle, conversion. Industrial conversion from manufacture of war material is, rece is receiving serious consideration. Obviously, it is highly desirable to encourage industry to cooperate in devising procedures that will make it acceptable not to push and lobby for unnecessary destructive military expenditures. But this is far, far from enough. We must view conversion much more broadly and be prepared to encompass all types of industrial technological endeavors. Wherever it becomes evident that anti-societal goals are being pursued, no matter how innocently, and they are not innocent, it's all profit and margin and greed. The fundamental premise has to be that industrial technological endeavors directed toward improvement of the quality of life are necessarily preferable to those which contribute to ecocide. And the second premise is that we must absolutely learn to accomplish transition of anti-societal to pro-societal endeavor soon. Indemnification. At the economic entrepreneurial level, the necessary ingredient is indemnification against loss of investment, which technology assessment dictates a change in direction. We would hardly be impressed by those econ economists who would say that this unrealistic that this is unrealistic, impractical, and unworkable. These same economists have failed in the past to include the secondary and severe costs to health and environment in their balance sheet thinking about corporate economics. It is our suggestion, if our suggestions remain unworkable or impractical, it will be because the economists fail to accept the major challenge which faces them to work out details that will be workable. The ultimate in economic stupidity is the denigration and destruction of life. So I guess that's where we're at, the ultimate of economic stupidity. In at least two major areas, the industrial entrepreneurs arrived at the position they are now in through public and governmental urging. We are not unmindful of complicity of the entrepreneurial lobbies in creating the governmental urgent urging. Nevertheless, it is clear that the public and government did support the Cold War concept and did thereby help create the vast military industry. Another illustration is in the field of atomic energy. There is little doubt that Congress and the Atomic Energy Commission worked hard to sell industry on the workers of the peaceful atom. Excuse me, to sell industry on the wonders of the peaceful atom, especially the wonder of nuclear electricity power production. Why would it not be proper to indemnify industry investors against capital loss required by a change in direction? Indeed, a failure to do this may well make it harder for the in the future to get an industry to participate in governmental sponsored areas, some of which at least may be quite worthwhile. A punitive approach to investors in technology, which proved to be unwise, can only be expected to be met with fierce resistance, subterfuge, distortions, half-truths, and lies in the effort to preserve parochial short-term economic interests, whatever the societal cost. Far better to meet this problem by learning some economics of indemnification. I can't see the time, but I think that's probably enough. Uh, yeah, I'm at 14 minutes. I'm going to end here, you guys. Uh, put your courage feet on. We can end nuclear. It's up to us. It's on our watch. 
educate yourself. And thanks for uh, following my channel. Talk to you later.